So the title of this talk is Ajax's History and uh, there is a byline which says build real time apps in JavaScript uh, but there is also a very controversial and uh, controversial title Ajax's History. Now the reason for that is uh, that JSFU happens to be a democracy and uh, once I submit my proposal I have to make sure that it gets voted. So uh, I have to you know have these kind of stupid tricks in games where I have to have eye catchy titles. I have to make a few other promises and uh, it happens, it works. If I make these promises, my proposal gets voted. So yeah, I have this chance to speak. Uh, and so I just, uh, I just uh, have this title slide up again. And uh, now, how many of you were here for Koshik's presentation after lunch? Okay, so that's like around 40-45%, uh, which is great. Uh, so a lot of what he said is going to be covered again. But what I'll do is I'll try to not get into the you know mucky details of it. I'll try to uh, give an overall picture of what I think is happening with web application development. And uh, I have this theory which I'll present uh, midway, and then there'll be some demos, and then uh, and then an open discussion and a Q&A session. So uh, <clears throat> let's just have a quick look at the story of the web. In the beginning, websites were nothing more than one-on-one -on -one mappings with file systems. I had a server which exposed a folder. And that folder had a static HTML or text files or binary files. And in my browser, I used to visit a website which used to just list that directory out for me. Or I could, you know, select a particular HTML and that would be my website. Of course, uh, thus we had HTML files which could link to other HTML files. And, uh, and thus uh, there was the concept of a browsable web as, as the user went from one location to another. And then at some point of time, uh, there were smart programmers who you know, discovered that HTML content doesn't have to be static. Uh, it can be dynamic. So there were server-side applications that used to uh, create content on, on the fly. And uh, these server-side applications had access to databases. <laughs> They had access to file systems and other services on the server. So uh, you also had various uh, concepts of sessions and redirects and, and stuff. So basically you had everything in place which allowed you to build complex web applications. And much of that is still around. But if you really think about it, uh, this paradigm of web applications was still the same. You had a user, he used to go to one location, then he used to click a link or submit a form and then go to some other location. So it's still the same paradigm. And then somewhere down the line, um, Ajax happened, and uh, everybody knows, or or, or uh, let's let, let me put it this way. Now, Gmail wasn't the first Ajax application out there, but it definitely was a flag bearer. At least for me personally, the first time I learned of of Ajax was when I used Gmail. So, uh, what did Gmail do? It had that funny funny feel to it. It didn't feel like a real website when I was first using it. The inbox a red count used to just update on its own. Or uh, if I wanted to open a mail in a new window, that used to not happen. It used to just open there and I couldn't get a new tab or a new window open. And uh, basically what Gmail did was it pioneered the use of asynchronous JavaScript uh, in a fully production uh, consumer driven application. And uh, you basically had very rich client application. You had uh, various attempts at frameworks such as Flex or Silverlight, which was basically the same thing. It was not JavaScript, but it was like running on top of a plugin. But again, it was asynchronous running on the client. And then uh, on the server, you had RESTful APIs or SOAP services. Mm, and that was the paradigm. Uh, now, uh, is this a real shift from the way we've been making web applications? Uh, probably, but I'd say still no. It's still the same paradigm, where you have <coughs> one request being created by the client and your server is responsible to uh, create a response for that one particular request and that response goes to just that one client nothing has changed okay so a user is not triggering an action but or maybe he is but still uh, the response is getting created for one client and uh, this is uh, this is a JPEG or a GIF that I stole from the internet, so credit to whoever first created it. And this shows how a typical Ajax web application would work. Of course, uh, XML isn't mandatory, it can be JSON or text or whatever. But yeah, so the paradigm, as I would put forward, still says the same. And now here comes the part that I first uh, first introduced to you. I think there is a real evolution that's going to happen in web applications. It's going to be very different from what we have been doing so far. And uh, what is that evolution going to be? I don't know. So it can be something completely unique, like out there. So uh, <clears throat> what did Koshik 
talk about uh, what has been the buzz around Node.js. It's basically been real-time web applications. It's been web sockets or uh, Ajax long polling or forever iframe or flash sockets or whatever comic technique you want to use. The idea is that the server would contain or would, the server would create a permanent channel with every client. It's permanent, which means that the server can push anytime it wants. One. Second, no longer does the, res the response from the server be dependent on a user action. What does that mean? It means that the server is no longer dependent on a, u on a user action to send some data back to the client. Which means that, okay, it can still work with the user action. So let's say I click on a button and the socket sends me some data. That can still happen. But what can also happen is that the server can read something on some third party API, maybe the Twitter stream, and then decide to push something to a, to, to a client. Or maybe there's a cron running on the on, on the server, or there's some third party app running somewhere, and the server can arbitrarily decide if it has to push data to the client. This is a huge, huge change from what we have been doing so far. Finally, now this is where things get really interesting. Uh, the server not only has a channel with each client, <coughs> but the server can identify each client. It knows that this channel is for uh, Amit. It knows that this channel is for Raj. It knows exactly which client it's talking to. And which means it gives us, the application creators, this capability to stream data to either one particular client or all clients or a select group of clients. So you can create some very nice logic and very nice interesting business cases around it. So what I'll do is now I'll quickly demo this application that I've been building. And um, after the demo, I'll quickly show you another small demo after which we'll get into the code. And then uh, we can just open it up for Q&A. So, <coughs> all right, so I'll start with the demo first. Let me get my browser up. And like, if you have your laptops on, you can just try this out yourself. So the URL would be review19.com. Let me see if I'm connected. Just Give me a sec while I just finish. All right, so uh, while we're here, I can just take a quick poll. How many of you have been web programming on, on the web, and been creating web applications for the past two years? All right, almost everybody. Five years, all right, less, even more, let's say 10 years, all right, the same hands again. Let me just take a while short, maybe 15, 20 years, all right, there's a hand there. So I have no idea what the web was uh, back then, so you can just ask me what it was like. But yeah, let me see if I've got it up. All right, so uh, the, the URL is review19.com. It is yet another project collaboration tool. So, Sorry for creating yet another similar software into the market, but definitely. What I'll do is I'll try to simulate. This is for search. So what I'll do is I'll try to simulate uh, two users using this application. Let me just get my phone more up. Okay, so I'll log in as myself over here. And uh, I will need somebody to volunteer their email address so that I can sign up and log in as on their behalf through this. So any email address? Quick point. Sure. So Kiran, Kiran at Haskeek.com. Kiran? At Haskeek.com. Password 123123. Okay. Okay, so Kiran's user has been created, uh, user account has been created. Let me just log in. Okay, so there you go. So this window is me, and this window is, is Kiran, right? Uh, now what I'll do is I'll have Kiran create a project. Let's say uh, the project is JS Foo Chennai. So I have a project created here, and let's say uh, Kiran wants to add me to the team. So let's say he wants to add me, so he's adding a new team member. Watch this space closely now. Uh, watch this space closely as Kiran adds a new team member. The project shows up. 
completely real time. It's the server just decided to push it to me. Why? Because I'm part of his team. So uh, let me in, enter this project and let me go to the board as Kiran. And let's say Kiran wants to add a new show, which is uh, invite some speakers. And uh, he does this, he creates this. Again, it shows up for more. So, what's happening here? Every time Kiran is taking some action, or every time I take some action, what happens is the action gets relayed to all the team members. So, if you go back to this presentation, it's it's this is what's happening. So, uh, my application is logically deciding what the team members are, and it's pushing selectively to them. And uh, so, let me go back to the demo. So, okay. So I just so uh, this is how deep the sync is. So let me go here <coughs> and uh, let me just demo this part again. You saw it update over there. Now this happens for every field. So it shows up, it shows up, it shows up again. If I add a task. And this is basically what uh, Kaushik uh, spoke about, and this is basically what this application implements. Uh, it's real time. It's using the same socket IO abstraction. Underneath, various transports can do their thing. We don't care because I'm a product dev developer at this point. I don't want to think about what's happening underneath. I want to just talk about functionality. So here's what we have. We have the capability to push selectively or to everyone. So this is something that server-side applications didn't have so far. Now, uh, let me just uh, demo some more stuff that this application can do. So you can basically drag things around and it gets reflected. Straightforward, very simple, and the code is also very simple. Uh, I actually built this application um, around November or December last year, and I was—I've uh, been a long-time programmer. And for all long-time programmers, we don't know JavaScript very well. If you've been working for more than eight, nine, ten years, you probably learned JavaScript when it was something else, and then you had to relearn JavaScript. So uh, I shouldn't be doing this, but if I just show you the code, you're probably going to laugh at me and want to throw shoes at me. But this is what the code actually looks like. It's good that you can't see it. <laughs> But yeah, so it was horrible code, and I wanted to, of course, refactor it. I also wanted to do two things. I knew that I cannot build a product in this market, <coughs> but I really liked what I built. So what should I do? I like the technology. So what I wanted to do was I want I wanted to extract out a framework or a platform upon which you can build various vertical apps, and those vertical apps will have the same real-time capabilities that this single app has. So. Uh, <coughs> So let me just uh, show you that. Uh, before I show you the code, I'll just run that refactored version of the application. That's still uh, work in progress. So I don't know how much sense it will make, but I think it's just best to show you. So the stack is fairly simple if you're interested. It's, I start my Mongo instance. Uh, let me find my app. Okay. Let us zoom in. Sorry? Uh, this is not interesting. So uh, there are seats here if you want to come in. <laughs> Really watch something that's not interesting. That's fine. Okay, so I'm just I've, what I've done is I've just started my server and my app. Okay, that's all. Now uh, what I actually want to do is demo the app itself. So let's do it. Okay. Well, this should be the port that it's running on. So I have the application running on my local <coughs> server, and now um, the project management. Uh, Module is still there, and this is basically the same thing. It still does the same thing. Okay, the same thing that we saw. But we also have another module out there, which is uh, which is a decision-making module. It is loosely based on SAP Streamer, and uh, let me just take a preview. So this will let families or businesses or teams decide on certain decisions real time, and they can be distributed around the world, and it lets them do that. So uh, it lets them through that. Uh, Let's them do that through allowing them to share their opinions, have polls, have a pros and cons list, have spot quotes, and so on. Uh, what I will not do is uh, is market my product, so I'll just turn it off and I'll take you to the code. So what I want to show you in the code is how the application, which was once just a single application, is now a platform and lets you do some interesting things. Uh, let's see. 
Now, this is a typical express socket I want. Okay. Now, what what do you expect in my app.js? In any case, yes. what I'm doing? Okay. okay. So this is okay. So now you're seeing the file structure again. This is a typical uh, socket I/O express app. So what do you expect in my app.js file? Socket. Okay. Yes. All right. The standard stuff. Basically, the standard stuff. I am requiring express. I am requiring socket IO. I am <coughs> defining my root somewhere, and I am doing a bunch of other config stuff. And something interesting. I have defined the modules. Is the font too small? Yes. <laughs> Alright, I, I don't want to see the settings right now, so would you mind coming forward with that if you really are interested? Or I can just... Bigger, bigger. <laughs> Alright. Give me a sec. Can't see it even from here. Okay. I just try again. I just take the font. Everybody can't see the single seat. Hmm? Everybody can't see the single seat. The many seats. Okay, I think. That's much better. That's right. So, right. So we have a pretty typical, uh, a typical um, Express Socket IO application, except uh, the concept of modules is being introduced. I am keeping it extremely simple at the moment. I just have an array for all the module names that I want to include. So where are these modules as such? Let me just walk you through my code. So um, here's what I have. For every module, I've got a package. Or, uh, or in JavaScript terms, I've got a folder. And, and um, every module internally has a model file and a sockets file. That is, I'm trying to keep the application as bare simple as possible. So I just it just has two modules. A model and a socket. So, uh, as you would guess, the model talks to the database and exposes an API that you want to use. And uh, socket basically uh, exposes events or triggers events with the client. So, uh, let me let me now. What's important is that every module also has a client side aspect to it. So, where does that go? That goes pretty much over here. So, oops, not stretchy. Uh, yeah. So, here's my projects module on server. Here's my projects module on client. And uh, it's you know the typical common JS AMD module. So that's what I've done over here on the client. And uh, and again, the API is defined as required. And and a bunch of things happen. Now, here's the cool part. Every module will work independently and doesn't have to have any dependencies outside itself. <coughs> And there is a bunch of glue code that ties all these modules and creates one single app out of it. So, uh, if you're interested, I can walk you through this glue as well. Uh, so, we already have an array for our modules. What do I need to do? Any socket I have users over here? Okay, so what do you want to do uh, if you have modules? What's, what would your approach be? Yeah. You want basically socket events enabled, uh, but you want to distribute them across uh, logical business units. So let's call those units modules. Let's say you have a project management software and you have a user management, and you don't want to mix up those two. You want to keep them as separate as possible. So we'll take different uh, events. So we'll designate one event, one set of events mm -hmm. for users, mm -hmm. and uh, other set of events. So basically, exactly. you group exactly. the. Uh, exactly. So uh, going by what he described, uh, the events for users is defined in sockets.js that belongs to users, and the events for projects is defined over here in socket.js for projects. And we have this little glue in my uh, app.js which basically uh, iterates through each uh, module available and into that's about it. Now. Uh, I'm expecting the sockets file to expose an initialize method, and it does that, in which uh, whatever module specific things have to happen happen. So uh, this is the way the the app is uh, the app is laid out. It's pretty simple, to be very honest. It's, it's, no, it's nothing fancy. 
except that it wasn't done before. I hadn't seen any example of it being done before. Now, of course, uh, there are there may be a few frameworks out there that do it, uh, but when I started on this, uh, there was nothing. So I had to just tie some glue and uh, break my code into modules, which was done. So. Uh, what I want to do now is I want to just have an open discussion if possible and uh, what I want you guys to focus on is um, either you can ask me uh, questions on what I have shared so far or uh, what I want to stress on is what do you think, do you really think that these kind of applications is is a new evolutionary step, is it something forward, is it, is, is, is it something very different from what we used to do? If yes, why? If not, why not? And um, if yes, what would you do with such kind of power? So it's just to open mic now and anybody wants to take this. You have 10 minutes. 10 minutes left? Yeah. Alright, so there's a lot of code that I can show you if you're interested. Yeah? Yeah? yeah. You want to know what is done next? What you just said? Thing is, like you said the server knows it and it pushes the change immediately. Yeah. So how would this achieve? You showed a lot of lines. The thing is, what actually? Okay. So uh, I just want to explain that. When I click sub submit here, what would happen in an Ajax application? The change is submitted to the server. Yes. A request is created. And uh, whatever I fill in in these fields is part of that request and a get or a post is made to the server. And what happens on the server once it gets this request? We can either update the database, we can have some something that has to be done mm -hmm. and it receives from uh, the client. Yes. And, 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 it and, it, and it creates a response. Now what happens is completely different. Or pretty much the same. It depends how you, as a programmer, want to use it. Uh, what happens in Socket IO is when I or Socket IO is just an abstraction. So when I say Socket IO, I obviously mean everything here. But what happens in Socket IO is when I click here, I, as a client-side programmer, can emit an event. That event can be, say, create a new ticket, right? The server will receive that event. Or if I have programmed my application such that some other client wants to receive the event, it can. So every server or every client can decide which all events <coughs> it wants to listen into. How does that happen? So just watch this code here. This is the event handler when a project creates event is triggered by a client. This particular server side module has decided to listen into that. So it says socket.on when it is this event, do whatever you want. Now something very funny can happen. Let's let's take the example of ticket create. Once it has created the ticket, the server then wants to decide what it should do next. It doesn't have a response to send. It can do whatever it likes, it can do nothing, or it can intimate every client or it can intimate specific client or it can trigger some third party service. You have this power right now. And uh, so let's say here in my case what happens is the server also after creating the ticket decides to trigger an event. Now that event is captured by a client. Let me just uh, <coughs> write that for you. Stuff, so uh, I'll just avoid it. But yeah, so what 
happens if you follow the trail. If you follow the trail of register socket event, you will find somewhere my object saying that okay, on this event, do this. So that's what it is. That's the thing. And uh, it's kind of very liberating. You can create whatever you like. There is no uh, there is no forced paradigm where you have to create a response for one request. This is where a lot of creative things will happen, I believe. And uh, hopefully this is just one thing stuff. Anybody else? See, you can scale it horizontally, so there is no number. There will be a limit on one instance on one process, but if you can scale it horizontally, it's not enough. Right? It's the limitation. I don't know the top of my head. I can check the box and share it with you. But I'm not asking in terms of numbers, but uh, in terms of current technology, uh, can we use or? Versus this, uh, which one scales better? Please repeat the question. Uh, so the question that he's asking is okay, if he builds this application with Ajax or if he builds it with WebSockets, which would scale better? Uh, why don't you try and answer that? Uh, what do you think happens in the case of Ajax? An entire HTTP request is created, an entire HTTP response is created. And if you have to relay it to, let's say, I have 10 team members, I have to create 10 responses. Now HTTP responses are quite large. Uh, in this case, I'm just going to send the data that was passed as the. Nothing is holding server, right? In, 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 in old Ajax. Nothing is holding the server in old Ajax. So you saw get put some something in server, right? Oh, shit. In Ajax, you don't hold anything in server side. But for the web you need to hold something in server side, right? To push back to the client. What do you mean? Ajax, you don't hold anything in server side. In Ajax, requests, you don't keep a just full of requests. Request. There's no like the stand is having ID or memory or getting something else. Mm. Let's talk gate, we wish to add some kind of ID, right? Okay. Can't be, can't so, be, can't uh, see. Exactly. Can't be. So, point of saying is that uh, plenty of clients have a persistent channel open with button with each and every client. Now. Right? And that's good. You know, if you follow the history of Node.js, that is actually an advantage at this point. If it's plenty of clients going to access the server, how much is going to open in the parallel? Way? There is no limit because you can scale horizontally. You can have as many as you want. Uh, that's the question. Whether it's better in Ajax or better in Ajax? Okay, which is this better? This you think that Ajax can't do. Oh, so okay. if there is, it's absolutely zero no inches. I mean. <coughs> okay. Uh, tired eyes, tired faces, looking down. Any other questions? Any other thoughts? Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, you're free to go home.